Hanafuda is the warlord that raged war against the Aoi kingdom, destroyed its citizens, resulting in Isho to blind himself while simultaneously being unfairly branded as a war criminal. I think we can now figure out what happened to make Fujitora blind himself. If you hadn't heard already, there has been a lot of supplementary information that has been released about One Piece from SBS Volume 110, new Viva cards, and a series of Q&As that Oda has released. There has been a lot of juicy information. But out of all of these information dumps, something that has really caught my eye is Oda's nonchalant reveal of Fujitora and Ryokugu's backstories. So let's get straight into it. In the SBS, a reader asks Oda, Odachi, Garchu, please tell us the former occupations of Fujitora and Green Bull before they became Marine Admirals. And essentially, this is Oda's response. Well, let me paraphrase. Oda explains that these new recruits were hand and picked by the military through a world military draft. And I guess that much we already knew from back in the Dressrosa arc, but we now know for sure that neither Fujitora or Ryokugu were originally part of the Marines. Ryokugu or Aramaki, he was a police officer from the Taya Kingdom in the South Blue who got thrown into prison, whereas Fujitora or Isho, he was a bodyguard at Twin Snake Island in the West Blue, and it seems like he was in debt due to his gambling, and so he was working as a bodyguard guard to repay his debt, but the world government bought him out for a large sum, recruiting him into the navy instead. Oda also revealed that prior to working in the Twin Snake Island, Isho was previously a military chief in the Aoi Kingdom, which is, or should I say was, located in the Grand Line. And here's where things get really juicy. The Aoi Kingdom, which translates to Blue Kingdom, this kingdom no longer exists, and Isho actually came known to be a major war criminal, likely due to his actions during whatever took place that led to this Aoi kingdom becoming destroyed. And like I said, we already knew that these two new admirals were recruited through an international military draft. And even when this was first mentioned in the Dressrosa arc, it did seem to suggest that neither of the two new admirals were actually a part of the Marines prior to this draft. They were enlisted into the Marines rather than a promotion given to lower ranks officers. But now that has been explicitly confirmed with further details, and better yet, with the new information about these dark prior lives of these two individuals, the first thing that I actually want to mention is, I think this really highlights just how desperate the Marines must have been. The Marines were so desperate that they recruited from outside of the Navy, outside of the existing Marine forces, for positions as high as the Admirals. We know that in the case of all the former admirals, Sakazuki, Borsellino, Kuzan, they had all been part of the Marines for quite some time. They enlisted when they were young and they steadily rose through the ranks, gaining that prestigious title of admiral when they had shown and proved their worth. Because when you think about it, the position of admiral isn't something that you would just give to anyone. They hold so much power and under the fleet admiral is the highest rank within the Marines. So it's kind of crazy to think that the world government would give give these positions to people who weren't already part, who weren't already indoctrinated into that marine ethos, into that marine institution. And so for the world government to actually find it necessary to go through this process, to go through this drafting process, I think it really emphasizes just how dire the situation was after the Marine Food War. I mean, we did see Kong express his concerns following the events of the Marine Food War, especially about retaining the forces of the Marines that was a problem that got compounded with Garp and Sengoku's resignations. And then you have to also factor in the fallout between Kuzan and Sakazuki, which as we know resulted in Kuzan also leaving the Marines. So I guess it does make sense the world government was in such a desperate position and they really desperately wanted to fill in the hole or the great holes, plural, that was left. But again, to fill those positions up with non-Navy men, non-Marine affiliated men, I think that's says a lot. Because I would say that this has now resulted in two 
very loose cannons, joining the Marines and joining the ranks of one of the most elite positions within the Marines. Two men who I actually think are liabilities. In the case of Aramaki, he's a fanatic who behaves widely, erratically, and is a bit too over eager. He's a zealot even for Sakazuki standards, and surely that's saying something. So even though he's loyal to the world government, this sort of fanaticism makes him super volatile, very, very unreliable. Whereas in the case of Isho, we almost have the other end of the spectrum. I would argue that Isho really isn't loyal at all. I mean, we have seen the fact that he is ready to put aside differences in some occasions to uphold his standing as a marine officer, but we have also seen on countless occasions, he has blatantly, blatantly defied the role and his functions as a marine admiral. You know, he's let pirates go, or he even prioritized the slaves over the lives of the Celestial Dragon. Which is funny because if this is how Isho was going to behave anyways, Garp should have just taken this position a long, long time ago and just done the same thing. I mean, I'm sure we all remember that Garp's reasons for never joining, never taking that admiral position was because he didn't want to be one of the lackeys of the Celestial Dragons. Because it seems that this is a key responsibility, a key function as an admiral. You have to answer directly to the Gorosei and you have to prioritize the lives of Celestial Dragons over the citizens. But ironically enough, Isho has been doing the exact opposite. He's acted in ways that he knows, he knows is blatantly counterposed to the objectives, to the wishes and interests of the Celestial Dragons. Because we saw this very recently with the flashback to the last reverie when, again, he actually let the revolutionaries get away because they were helping the slaves. Again, these two are liabilities. But I guess in the world government's defense, it's not like they just went around and started recruiting just about anyone. You know, they didn't actually recruit from the revolutionaries or the pirates, for example. And we do now know that this selection pool, this drafting system was limited exclusively to world government affiliated nations only. Because one of the questions that were asked through that Q&A series were, what kind of system is the world military draft that added Fujitora and Nokugu to the Marines forces? And Oda answered, countries affiliated with the world government have their own soldiers for protection. Through the world military draft, the Marines strengthen their own military by drafting the most capable soldiers from these ranks. This draft also became a trigger for the recent Eight Nation Revolution as the weakening of national defense forces may have contributed to the revolution's success. And so this information, coupled with what we got from the SBS, well, that makes things very, very interesting. Again, I just have to point out the irony here. It was the world's military draft that actually contributed to the success of the revolutions all around the world, which is in turn exposed the world government and the Marines to more further vulnerability. I guess this is Oda's way of saying desperate times do not call for desperate measures, but I digress, so let's get back to Isho. So obviously the most interesting, or at least for me, the most interesting thing about this teaser into Isho's background is the fact is his title of war criminal. This immediately sets off so many questions, and I'm sure we've all been long curious about Isho's past and the reasons what has led him to blind himself, but this, this information has taken that to a whole new level. On one hand, this backstory does seem like it could just be a reference to the real-life inspirations that has resulted in Isho's character. So as many of you may know already, all of the admirals are tributes to older Japanese actors. And it seems that in the case of Isho, he was based on Shintaro Katsu and one of his very well-known works, Zato Ichi. So Zato Ichi is the main character of a long-running Japanese film series. It focuses on a blind masseur cross gambler who in secret is actually a very skilled swordsman. Zato Ichi is known for his newfound compassion and his morality after having spent many years as a Yakuza killing many, many people. So now his life revolves around repenting. And so with the information that we've gotten about Isho, you can clearly see the links there about a war criminal who is now living in remorse, living a more morally up 
bright life. So in that case, this could mean that Oda, if he decides to stay quite truthful to this real life inspiration, then maybe Isho's current nature, his current characterization is just his reborn self. In reality, he did in fact commit war crimes and following his rebirth, his spiritual rebirth, he has taken his own eyes out, unable to face what he's done, ashamed at what he's done. So that's one option. But let's be honest here, knowing One Piece and knowing the type of character that Isho is, I'm sure that this is just some classic misunderstanding. For one, when Isho commented on his blindness, he said that he blinded himself after he saw terrible things. Not because he did terrible things. And maybe this is just me, maybe I'm reading way too much into it, but in my interpretation, that sort of dialogue or that sort of inner monologue, there's an implied passivity in that that suggests that he wasn't the one responsible for those said terrible things. It's as if he was saying that he just couldn't bear to witness the terrible state of the world around him. And I don't know about you, but these circumstances surrounding Isho's dark past, well, I can't help but feel that this feels extraordinarily similar to the Kuma is a tyrant scenario. As you may remember, it was revealed in the Egghead Island arc that Kuma has just been deemed a tyrant because this was a false title given to him by King Bekori, King Bekori being the true tyrant himself. But because Sorbet Kingdom was affiliated with the world government, this un fair demonization of Kuma is the title that stuck, where in reality, this was all a lie that was spun to paint Kuma as a bad guy, when really he was just doing the right thing. So this situation with Isho feels like it could be a very similar case where Isho is known as a war criminal for his actions, when really he was probably just fighting the bad guys to help innocent people escape or something. Especially knowing that the Aoi kingdom lost and got destroyed, well after all, there's a famous saying that history is written by the victors and so it seems that whichever nation won or whichever group won against the Aoi kingdom, they're the ones that wrote history, they're the ones that branded Isho with the unfair title of war criminal. And in that way, if you actually think about it, it's very apt that Isho was introduced in the Dressrosa arc, the same arc where Doflamingo was the primary antagonist. And the reason why I say this is because you may remember that it was Doflamingo who made a very very similar a comment many years ago, many arcs ago during the Marineford War when he said that history is decided by the winners or really his words were something along the lines of the side of justice is the side of the winners. So in that case, who were the winners? Who were the winners in the case of Aori Kingdom? Who rewrote history and deemed Isho the war criminal? Well, I do happen to think that there are a few more clues or details from the series that we may be able to piece together and we may just be able to answer this question. But before I explain why, a quick reminder to please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I'd really appreciate your help in getting to 100,000 subscribers and this means that you'll get more One Piece discussions without these sort of interruptions. So please subscribe and let's move on. And for starters, I think we need to take Isho's character and think about what sort of major plot lines, what sort of character traits, what sort of plot arcs has he been majorly intertwined with. Because because yes, obviously the events of Dressrosa is one of them, but something that involves him quite personally, something that he has driven himself is his staunch opposition to the Seven Warlord system. You may remember that Isho actually spearheaded the campaign to abolish the Shichibukai. And he did this despite the fact that the Warlords is actually a critical piece in the balance of the world's powers. And without this One Piece, without the Warlords, this could actually place the world government and place the marines in a more vulnerable position. But Isho explicitly said that he didn't care. And if you actually look at his dialogue in chapter 735, it seems like Isho had this goal to abolish the warlord system already in mind. He knew he wanted to do this even before he witnessed the extent of Doflamingo's actions in Dressrosa. In fact, if you look at the dialogue and the interaction between Isho and Doflamingo, it seems like Isho might have even wanted the 
admiral position because he wanted to have enough power, enough standing to try and bring an end to the warlord system. He warned Doflamingo about the events that are going to take place at the next reverie, meaning that by this point, he already had plans in mind. He already had plans in motion. So this got me thinking, well, what if there is something deeper? There is something more personal, something that goes beyond Isho just being morally upright than him being opposed to the corruption of the warlords. Which then got me thinking, this might have to do with how Aoi kingdom got destroyed, and this might have to do with how he became known as the war criminal. Meaning that Aoi kingdom's war, Aoi kingdom's conflict was actually against a pirate, and more specifically, one of the seven warlords. And this, this is why Isho is so passionate about the cause. Now granted, we really don't have a lot of information about the earlier days of any of the warlords to suggest that they're somehow intertwined with Isho and the Aoi kingdom, but I guess you could just outright rule out Doflamingo because there's no way that Isho would have worked with him at Dressrosa, even if it was just for a brief period, if it was in fact Doflamingo who tried to take over Aoi kingdom and he's the one that decimated all of its citizens. We know that Isho is too principled of a man to have done that. But there is actually one warlord who has stuck out and has piqued my interest, and that warlord is Hanafuda, the warlord that Ace defeated four years ago. So as a character who's only been introduced by way of an SBS, we really don't actually know all that much about Hanafuda either. In fact, we probably know less about him than any of the other warlords. Call me crazy, but I do think that there may be clues that suggest that Hanafuda is the warlord that raged war against the Aoi kingdom, destroyed its citizens, resulting in Isho to blind himself while simultaneously being unfairly branded as a war criminal. Okay, so humor me and picture this scenario. Many, many years ago, Hanafuda arrives at the Aoi kingdom and tries to take over. Isho, as the military chief at the time, resists and tries to defend his citizens, defend his kingdom. And in doing so, as a very skilled swordsman, as a very skilled combatant, Isho takes out a lot of Hanafuda's subordinates. However, because of Hanafuda's warlord title, his warlord position, his crimes against the Aoi kingdom gets absolved. Maybe the marines even come to aid Hanafuda in his exploitation of the Aoi kingdom, ultimately resulting in the entire destruction of the Aoi kingdom. Who knows, maybe Isho, unable to stand the thought of his kingdom being ruled by this corrupt, cruel leader, uses his devil fruit powers to destroy it all. Obviously, after ensuring that he wouldn't be the one directly killing any of the innocent civilians, maybe it occurred after all the citizens were able to escape and our kingdom was just ruled by Hanafuda and his subordinates. But this does result in him being called the war criminal for his actions, and this drives Isho mad. The atrocities that were committed against his people, the blind eye that the world government and the marines turned just because of Hanafuda's status. Blind eye, see what I did there? This makes him crazy, ultimately driving Isho to blind himself, unable to accept it, unable to take this corruption. And in which case, it's only natural that Isho developed this sort of resentment towards the warlord system and the resentment against the marines for allowing warlords to act in this sort of manner. These sentiments only worsen as he himself witnesses what happened to Dressrosa under Doflamingo and learns about what happened to Arabasta under Crocodile. But let's take a step back and let's go back a bit. Why have I fixated on Hanafuda? Because as random or as left field as it may have seemed, I didn't choose him randomly. There is a logic to my chaos. Because although, as I said, Hanafuda hasn't been formally introduced in the series itself, but we do know some interesting details about him by way of SBS Volume 109. Oda reveals some very interesting details, namely that his hobby was to collect ancient Zoan devil fruits. Another very interesting fact is his name, Hanafuda. And Hanafuda is actually the name of a Japanese playing card game. And I have to say, these two pieces of information, well, this seems quite familiar. When it comes to the playing card game, we know that playing cards, that's a motif that we saw very recently. Very recently in the Wano arc amongst Kaido's beast pirates. And it just so happens to be that the beast pirates are made up of Zoan Devil Fruit users. And when it comes to Kaido's top officers, ancient Zoan Devil Fruit users. And the reason why I bring this up is because it bears
begs the question of whether Hanafuda was once somehow affiliated with Kaido. Maybe Hanafuda was actually one of the Beast Pirates before breaking away, before he made a name for himself to earn the almighty warlord title. But despite leaving the Beast Pirates, he was still influenced by Kaido and his time at Wano because the timeline could work. We know that Kaido took over Wano 28 years ago. Having witnessed Kaido's actions at Wano, maybe Hanafuda was inspired to try and do the same thing and he tried to replicate this at Aoi Kingdom. And the reason why I bring this up is because of Isho's own seeming connections to Wano. Isho's attire seems to be very much influenced by traditional Japanese clothes. And we know that he's dressed like this for a long time because of drawings from when he was a child. And so with Wano being very much the representative of Japan in the One Piece universe, well this has always raised questions about Isho's own heritage, whether he himself is actually from Wano. Well this got me thinking, maybe the Wano connection is actually via Hanafuda, and look maybe that's a bit of a stretch, but there is another reason why I've chosen Hanafuda, and that was really just via the process of elimination. I mean, I've already said why I don't think it could be Doffy, but even the other characters, you know, characters like Jinbei and Kuma, you can almost immediately rule out. Even Boa Hancock, I don't think it would be in her nature, there's nothing to suggest that she ever tried to take over a kingdom. The only other possibly plausible connections would be Moria, who funnily enough has his own connection to Wano, and potentially Crocodile. But even in both their cases, we know that Moria only gained his warlord title after establishing Thriller Bark. And in the case of Crocodile, he chose Arabasta specifically because of its connections to Pluton. Beca so, because of Hanafuda being almost a blank state and not having detailed historical information, it seems like out of the warlords, he would make the most sense. Anyways, until I'm proven right, or until what is most likely I am proven terribly, terribly wrong, those were some of my ideas when I first read about Isho's storied past. And now that I've shared my thoughts, please share yours by leaving a comment below. Let me know what you think about my speculations. If, if you've enjoyed today's discussion, please like and share the video and please do subscribe. You can also support the channel further by becoming a member like these wonderful, wonderful people. But as always, thank you so much for listening to another one of my ramblings. This is Joy Girl and I'll see you again soon.